Um, I'll start with my disclosures. Uh, I did co-develop this thing called DMAR with Dr. Matt Oliver that you're going to hear about tomorrow. Um, I'm part of this ISPD North American Research Consortium which has received some seed money from Baxter Corporation. And I've speak, spoken at Canadian and PD University and received some funds for that that donated to charity. So I was asked to come and talk to you about this North American Research Consortium that we've got up and going. And this slide pretty much sums up why. I get asked to give talks on PD and they say, well, can you come and summarize the literature on whatever topic? And Fred suffered through one of these in Dallas. I find a way to stretch those talks out to 30 minutes. But the reality is I could summarize most of those talks up with this slide, which is we really don't have a whole lot of high quality practice changing evidence to guide care. And I, I say that kind of flippantly and I'm probably being overly dramatic. We certainly have examples of uh, big trials like Adamex and things that have been practice changing. But by and large, particularly in specific areas, the amount of really high quality data that we have that sh should really change our practice is quite limited. And so we kind of fly by the seat of our pants. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what this North American Research Consortium is. Where did it come from? How did it start? Um, why we've elected to focus on peritoneal dialysis catheter practices and outcomes. And then talk a little bit about the progress we've made to date and where we're headed uh, as we, we go forward. So let's start with the background. So Dr. Tom Golper from Vanderbilt decided he was going to uh, assemble a bunch of people in Nashville in the spring of 2013. And the intent of that meeting was to get the North American chapter of the ISPD together and talk about the future. Um, Dr. Finkelstein was there, a number of you in the room were there. And at that meeting, there were basically two decisions made. One was we need to do some bigger, better research to really start to answer some of these questions that have been bugging us for decades and establish this North American Research Consortium. So a bunch of interested sites, a network of sites that have the volume of patients and um, the ability to get some of these big trials done. And the other decision that was made is that we should focus on PD catheters. Um, there was this sensation in the room that the PD catheter practices were quite variable. What people do from center to center was very different. There's also this feeling that a lot of the centers that publish on this stuff are very interested and motivated and have very good outcomes, but it's not clear how everybody else is doing. And a lot of people in the room had a feeling that, you know, 20% of my catheters never work. Why is that? So this was felt to be a, a good area to kind of focus on initially. So shortly after that meeting, an invitation went out and a number of sites came forward and wanted to participate. So to date, we've had just over 50 sites across North America that have agreed to participate in this North American Research Consortium. And they come from basically everywhere and a number actually come from British Columbia who've been very supportive of this project and I thank you for that. So following the meeting, the ISPD, the North American chapter, put out a call for proposals. And essentially what they did was ask investigators to come forward with their ideas about what we should do specifically. We were lucky, myself and Dr. Oliver, were lucky enough to, to have a proposal that was put forward and, and thought to be um, a good way forward. And so we put together some applications to get some initial seed money from Baxter in the, the fall and, and winter of, of 2013. By February of 2014, we were able to get some of that money and the, the funding was committed and transferred. And in the spring, we formed a steering committee. And that steering committee consisted of Dr. Oliver and myself, as well as some people from various North American sites. And we had a lot of people that were intimately involved with PDOPS and, and DOPS in Ann Arbor uh, as well, an attempt to kind of harmonize what we were doing with, with many of the DOPS initiatives. And at the end of the day, we proposed three things. So the first phase was to do a survey of practices. So one of the things we really didn't know, we had a lot of ideas about what was going on, but we didn't have a firm sense of how much variability there really was in practice. So we started with a survey, and some of you guys will have participated in that. I'm gonna show you some of the results from it. To just get a sense of what are people doing so that we could start to be a little bit more intelligent about designing data collection instruments and, and fine tuning our questions moving forward. The second thing we did was to decide to focus specifically on the timing of PD catheter placement and the method of placement. So when should we put these things in? What type of catheter should we put in? And how should we do it? 
Is there any, anything about that process that actually dictates outcomes or does it just matter that you've got an interested operator and somebody that's paying attention? <coughs> and then the final part of this, and what I think is probably the more innovative and, and interesting part, was to create some infrastructure for quality improvement. Um, this is obviously an area of real interest to me. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this tomorrow. But I really feel a lot of times we create registries. We collect a bunch of data. We send it back to sites, a lot of very high-level metrics. The part we don't do very well is actually help people get better. So the vision of this was let's collect some high-quality information at a bunch of sites. Let's see how we're doing, provide you with your local data, and compare you against all the other institutions in North America that are participating, so you have a sense of where you stand. But then take it a step further. So what are the process measures that are driving the outcomes that you guys are achieving? Where are their issues? And where should you focus your efforts to get better? And then ideally provide some information around how you might do that. So providing this infrastructure for quality improvement and, and the platform for collecting the data, feeding it back to people, and then helping people improve was the third part of it. So I want to talk a little bit about the focus on peritoneal dialysis catheters. Why would you, you pick this topic? And I alluded to a little bit of this earlier. But we have an obsession with access. We spent the whole morning talking about the evils of, of central venous catheters. Um, you know, PD is no different. So in order to do dialysis, you need access. And for PD, you need a PD catheter. And that access is a lifeline for people. So the fundamental underpinnings of PD, if you want to achieve good outcomes, you need a safe, reliable access to the peritoneal cavity. And this is where it all starts. The other thing, as I mentioned, was that when you look in the literature that does exist, there's tremendous variability in terms of practice. So how do these things get managed? preoperatively, perioperatively, what are the actual uh, operators doing during the insertion, and then in terms of follow-up, so how we manage the catheters once they're placed to try to prevent complications. There's also tremendous variability in outcomes. So if you read John Crabtree's papers, 98.8% of his catheters work. I'm not sure that's the experience a lot of other places. And why is that? Do you need a John Crabtree in every single center in order to do well, or can you get away with somebody um, less skilled or less interested? And what is it that drives the differences between the outcomes that John Crabtree gets and everybody else does? So on the surface, I think I got this job because I was really naive. I thought, this is a pretty straightforward thing. You stick a tube in the belly and then you see if it works. Um, there's really only three components to this. Preoperative planning, so what are you doing? Perioperative antibiotics, how do you kind of mark up the patient, get them ready for the catheter placement. The second part is the actual insertion, and then the post-operative care. But unfortunately, this kind of, well, the picture says it. Um, as we started to dig into this, there's a ton of moving parts. So when you talk to experienced operators or people that place catheters, the nursing staff that cares for them perioperatively, you start to realize that you can read the literature all you like, and you really don't get a firm sense of how many different moving parts there are in this process. Everything from what antibiotics do you give perioperatively, um, how do you prepare the patient for surgery, do you decide the location of the deep cuff, the incision, mark the exit site with a protractor like Dr. Crabtree does, um, all of those things that happen prior to going to the OR. And then there's a million different things about the operation itself that vary from center to center and person to person. So who's putting them in? Is it a nephrologist? Is it IR? Is it a surgeon? What method of placement do they use? Is it laparotomy, laparoscopy? Is it you know, percutaneous techniques? Um, and then cuffs, one cuff, two cuff, where do you put the cuff? Where are you going to put the, the incision? Is it going to be paramedian, lateral? Is it going to be midline? Um, the tunnel segment, do you do rectus sheath tunneling? There's literally hundreds of different variables as you talk to people that might be important. And when you talk to an operator that believes in them, they're definitely important. And so it's been fascinating for me because I don't put these things in to talk to people that do and really come to, to terms with how much might influence PD catheter outcomes. The trick is making sense of it. So if there are a thousand variables, how do you figure out which ones are important and how do you improve practice without knowing that? So, there's been a few systematic reviews done in this area to look at PD catheter outcomes. Um, probably the, the best one was done by Stripoli a few years ago now. 
um, where they looked at the randomized trials that have been done in this area to kind of guide things. And this summarizes it. Basically, there are a lot of single center studies with extremely small numbers. They've got results. The problem is, is that the results are not all that reliable. Um, even if they're well done, when you've only got five or ten outcomes, it's very difficult to make sense of whether these things are important and whether you can believe the data. And when I went through this, and it took me half an hour to go through the evidence to come to the conclusion that we really have never shown that anything is a significant advantage or that any of these factors clearly play a, a difference in, in terms of PD catheter outcomes. It's kind of, it, it's problematic. You go through training and you think, you get told all these things about PD catheters and how they should be done and, and all of this, but when you actually go back and see well, how have we studied this, it's not entirely clear. So I want to talk a little bit about progress that we've made to date. And the first thing I, I said we were going to do was do a survey of PD catheter practices and get a sense of what the different programs were doing. So we surveyed 51 sites, and at the time that I crunched this data, we had data back from 40 of them. We've now completed all this. But about two-thirds of the sites that are participating in the consortium are academic sites. The rest are not. Um, about half are Canadian sites. The rest are from the U.S. And there's a real variety in terms of the size of the programs. In some of them, there are only two physicians that care for patients. Um, in others, there are over 20 physicians caring for the peritoneal dialysis population. But the average is around six. If you look at the size of those programs, again, there's tremendous variation. And the, the, one of the things that, that has been eye-opening for me is, is looking and learning about the American experience. The way that care is structured and organized in the U.S. Is, is very different than it is here. We look very homogeneous. Most of our programs are relatively large, with at least the academic programs. Um, we see a fair number of patients. And our care is, is kind of the continuum of care. So we provide pre-dialysis care. We see those patients through to starting dialysis and then care for them on dialysis. In the U.S., there are models like that, but there are also a lot of models where it's very fragmented. So uh, several centers put in the catheters. A lot of the dialysis programs don't see the patients until they land on their doorstep having started dialysis. And then they may or may not offer peritoneal dialysis. Some programs don't. So it's much more fragmented. And just doing something as simple as trying to find all of the PD catheters that have been placed in a program becomes incredibly challenging. So there's real variation in size. There's also real variability in, in experience and volume with PD catheter placement. So in some sites, you know, like ours, we do about 80 catheters a year. In, in other places, the last 12 months when we asked them, hadn't done any, um, and some had done fewer than 10, a sizable portion of sites. So if, like other surgical procedures, volume is important, this is a very relevant finding. There's also variability in who placed the catheter. So most places general surgeons were doing this, but a lot of nephrologists, vascular surgeons, urologists, radiologists, and in some places advanced practice nurses were placing these. So a lot of variability in terms of who puts them in. And 5% of the sites we surveyed don't use preoperative antibiotics. So when they go for PD catheter placement, they don't give them antibiotics prophylactically. In terms of the types of catheters that are available, we asked people what could you place at your center. So if you had a patient who was obese and needed an upper abdominal catheter or a presternal catheter, do you have the capacity to place this? Um, and the vast majority of sites offered a standard catheter. Um, about 35% of sites were doing embedded catheters or buried catheters. Presternal catheters and upper abdominal catheters were in about 40% of sites. So the majority of sites weren't doing these specialized forms of catheters. You could get the standard catheter, but when it started to vary from that, very few sites were actually doing that. In terms of the other details, it seems like everybody was a, bought into the idea of a double cuff catheter, and there's, there's certainly some you know, rationale for using a double, double cuff catheter over a single cuff catheter. But again, when you look at the data, there's, there's nothing to support this. Um, about an even split between swan neck catheters and, and straight external segments. And then in terms of the location, the vast majority of people were going into the rectus muscle, but about 15% were still using midline incisions. And this comes down again to operative technique, uh, a lot of it. In terms of the post-op care, this again was interesting. You kind of get used to what you do locally. Um, but in certain places in the U.S., there are people that place catheters and don't flush them, and they, they tell us that their outcomes are actually quite good. 
In other places, the other end of the extreme, they're flushing catheters three times a week, and this, this isn't just in the hemo population, you know, people that are on hemo waiting for, for PD. This was people coming into clinic three times a week to get their catheters flushed. So tremendous investment of time and resources to do that. Uh, and you can imagine if you could get away with no flushing, that would have a big impact on the way you organize resources in your program. Follow-up again was variable. Some places saw their PD patients every month. Some it was every two months or every three months. No consistency there. So that's the results of the survey. I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, up-to-date on, on the funding. Um, to do a study of this size obviously takes a lot of time and commitment, but it also takes a lot of money. And to do some of the preliminary work, we estimate we probably need about a half a million dollars. Um, we've been able to raise half that money now, so Baxter's provided some support to get us out of the gate. The Ontario Renal Network has committed some money as well to fund the Ontario portion of this, and I'm hoping Braden will give me some more money if I humiliate him publicly um, to do this type of thing in, in Alberta as well. So we're about halfway there. We've got enough money now to get started, and we're going to get started. Um, but this is where we're investing most of our time at, at, uh, at the present. So initially, we did the typical academic thing, which is to review the literature, make yourself a, an expert in a week, and then design some data collection forms. And we realized very quickly that there wasn't a whole lot of data to guide us, as I've told you. So then we decided, well, let's sit down with the people who deliver care and really go in detail about what they think determines PD catheter outcomes. So I had a very enlightening session with, with Lori and our nurses going through, what do you guys actually do with these patients when they show up? So what's the plan before they get their catheter placed? Once it's in, what do you do with them? When they come to clinic, what is it you're looking for? What do you do? When do you do the, the, the dressing changes? When can they shower? All of these little variables. And y you come to realize that you have absolutely no idea what's going on with patients except for that 15 minutes that you spend in the room with them when they come to clinic. Um, so that was very eye-opening, and it allowed us to really refine our data collection instruments. So we've designed a nursing visit form to track nursing visits that's very focused, it's very concise, but it's also focused on the things that nurses believe drive the outcomes that people get with their catheters. The next part of that will be that we're going to vet that form with other programs and, and other nursing experts. And I'll probably be leaning a lot of you guys in the room to do that. Um, we've decided that we want to take the approach that we're going to widely vet these things before we start data collection so that the people on the ground that are delivering care think they're relevant, that we've captured all the stuff that we need to capture. And that way, once we get up and running, we're not collecting a bunch of things that are irrelevant and we haven't omitted things that are important. Dr. Oliver in Toronto has been doing a similar thing with physicians um, and operators, the people that place the catheters. So he came up with a preliminary version of a data collection form to capture all the variables around the time of the OR or the insertion. And he's vetted this now with a number of people, the Crabtrees of the world, the Sean Armstrongs, all the people that have a real interest in this. Um, I think he's spoken to Sunit and others here. Uh, if he hasn't, he will be. But we really want to make sure we get this right, and the next step is to then build the registry. So it's built on the backbone of our DMAR system that I'll, I'll go through tomorrow with you. We've done a lot of this work for the last decade, tracking PD catheter outcomes, but there were some changes that need to be made to do this properly. So we're going to build this electronically, pilot it at some Canadian sites and some American sites, probably three or four, and then once it's stable and we, we think that it's doing the job we need to do, we're going to roll it out to the other 50 sites and get started. In terms of future directions, so we're at this stage now where we've got a lot of the money we need to do this project. We're going to continue to raise funds. One of the challenges, of course, is that setting up the network isn't sexy to anybody. So if you want to go to CIHR and get money to set up a network, they're not all that interested. But if you have a network and you want to do some studies, that's more attractive. So we're going to try to get this network up and running and then go to peer-reviewed agencies, the NIH and CIHR, to get some funding. The second thing, of course, is to finish the pilot data collection so that we can roll it out to the other sites and get started in earnest um, on answering some of these questions. And I'd encourage any of you guys, if you're not familiar with this project or you want to get involved, to, to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. We're still looking to recruit sites, and the, the more the merrier. The intent would be that we pay people for data collection. Um, 
you know, historically, we've kind of done this out of the goodness of people's heart. And, you know, there, there is a feeling that, that may be the best way to do it. And you might not be wrong because raising money is difficult. But we've always felt if you want to collect really high quality data and do it properly, you have to pay people for the data entry. And that's the plan with this. So we're going to try and raise the money to do that. So the people that get involved are reimbursed for the time they spent doing it. And we hope that ultimately this will lead to a really useful quality improvement project for you and, and give you a lot of valuable information about how you're doing and how you compare to your colleagues.